This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. On the local news roundup, are you prepared to pay more in sales tax to support the arts? Mecklenburg County commissioners ponder that question, too. BB&T and SunTrust come up with a name for their newly merged bank. The truest thing that can be said is that they're now being sued for trademark infringement. The number of homicides for 2019 in Charlotte now e- almost equals the total for all of last year. We're one away. And Mecklenburg County Sheriff McFadden tangles with the legislature over ICE. Our roundtable of reporters is ready to detail those and other stories, and those reporters include Steve Harrison from WFAE News. Good morning and welcome to you. Thanks, Mike. Glenn Birkins is editor and publisher of QCityMetro.com. Good morning. Good morning. Eric Spanberg is managing editor of the Charlotte Business Journal. Good morning, Mike. And we welcome Chandler Morgan, a reporter from WBTV News for the very first time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Welcome. We're all on the radio, but if you must, you can also watch us on Facebook Live. Look if you want to see the back of Eric's head. (laughs) Uh, The city kept their uh, budget for next year revenue neutral in the face of the property revaluation uh, that we know has been going on. Mecklenburg County did not. You're likely to pay more in property taxes next year as a result. We get the bill next month. Uh, But now the county is considering a quarter cent increase in county sales taxes to fund the arts, greenways, and higher pay for teachers. They debated the question this week, and they heard from citizens. Arts unify people. Arts belong to the community. Our community is a better place because of what the Arts and Science Council does to support the work of individual artists like me. A lot of the symphony, opera, that's what really attracts people and makes a vibrant city where you want to live, when you want to move. That from WBTV's coverage of that meeting. How many people turned out to speak for or against this quarter cent sales tax hike? I counted 18 the other night, and there was only one. Only 18 people in the audience? No, no, I counted 18 people speakers. who spoke. Okay. Yeah, 18 speakers. The, the government center was full. I counted 18 speakers, and only one was questioning the idea of using the tax for arts. Uh, so it, it was mostly a pro arts. So this seems to have, uh, at least of the people in the room, overwhelming support. What does that say? That they that they were mo- more motivated to come than the naysayers, or it, we have overwhelming support? Well, that was the statement that was made by Commissioner Pat Cotham at the end. She said, or I'm sorry, during the debate, she said that she was doubtful that the rest of the community yeah. was as supportive as what was in the audience. It's really hard to tell. I mean, this has been a pretty quiet subject up until this week, and then it got noisy in a hurry, and I'm curious to see what comes out of the workshop on Tuesday when they're going to debate this for a couple more hours. The other thing we should note is that most of the speakers, many of the speakers at least, uh, are in the arts. They represented arts organizations, or they were artists themselves, or uh, the husbands or even yeah. parents of people who were in the arts. This, Board members, yeah, you're right. This was uh, proposed by the Arts and Science Council several months ago, and, and the Arts and Science Council has a funding model that worked marvelously for a long, long time. I think they were one of the top arts fundraisers in the country, and then suddenly with the recession, that whole model collapsed, and it's never come back, so they need this money, but they don't need the $50 million dollars that this would raise and so it's been proposed that they get some of the money the rest would go to parks and greenways and to teachers so about half of that money would go to the arts and 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 culture what would that buy us how would things change with regard to all the things that would get funded if that money came through well i think trevor fuller got at some of those questions that you're asking or he asked some of those questions he was saying how do we hit on this number, how did we decide on the split in terms of how it's shared? Uh, there has not been a great deal of explanation beyond what you said, which is that the fundraising model is broken. The ASC has said that they will no longer use that corporate and individual donor model if they get this tax, and they've pointed to some of the other cities that use public money. Uh, 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 go ahead, Steve. No, I was just going to say. Um, I think one thing that's interesting about this debate is that this comes right after um, the county raised property Property taxes. taxes. The budget grew by 9%. So, you know, I think it's it's worth asking why wasn't some of this or all of this rolled into the budget? 
There's no reason that says you can't fund the arts. And they do, your, fu they do fund they, the arts. But have more. I mean, yes. because, you know, just strategically, when you grow your budget by 9% and you have all kinds of new programs, and there were tons of new programs this year, and you have one more new program, more funding for the arts, we're not talking about it. It flies under the radar. But when you do a full new sales tax, it gets everyone's attention. Right. It becomes a huge battle. And, and you're right. They've set themselves up for this whole debate, and we heard some of it this week, which is, well, why are you only giving teachers and education $8 million, but you're giving the arts $24.5 million? Or why are the towns getting $2.5 million? It, it does set up all of these, these arguments, and I, I think it's going to be – you know, interesting to see what the public response does to the debate when they have that next round on Tuesday. Well, let's go back to the funding model that's allegedly broken because yeah. uh, people have moved here and don't know anything about the Arts and Science Council. When I moved here in 1985 uh, and, and worked for another broadcast facility, it was mandated that you gave. Yeah. And we had an internal fundraising campaign for the Arts and Science Council. Uh, which included performances. I mean, literally, the entire staff came to a performance and they were asked to give, and we did. Uh, it's very much like how the United Way operated. Is the United Way suffering yes. the same way? Yes. Yeah. I, so what happened to the model? Why did it collapse? Well, Why didn't it come back after the recession? Because well, what happened was you would have not only corporate giving, giving from their own philanthropic coffers, you'd have the employees doing payroll deductions. And, and I would actually argue that it started uh, collapsing before the recession. Okay. I think the recession was kind of the nail in the coffin, but there were all of these corporate campaigns going on when I moved here in, in 2000 as well, not just for the Arts and Science Council, as you mentioned. There were a host of uh, different uh, philanthropic organizations you could give to, including United Way. Uh, companies just stopped doing that for, for whatever reason. And many of them started pulling back away from that even before the recession. Well, I think there were a couple things. You're absolutely right, Glenn. I think that the employees began to rebel to an extent. I mean, it was almost like being in a, in a you know, paper mill town. Or you know, it was just like it was an edict, as you say. Oh, it was yes. like, you will give. Uh -huh. uh, the law firms, uh, all, the, all the major businesses, it was just like, you'll give at this level, this level, and this level for ASC and United Way. And I think that that employees got sick of it and began to grumble. And I also think that when you had the United Way scandal that led to the resignation of the executive director, I think that probably hurt it. And then it came the recession, and from there it just kind of fell apart. The, I think uh, it reflects a different time in Charlotte, yes. actually. Yes. Uh, it was a time when uh, – there was once a time when the big banks and the, and the CEOs of those banks, uh, Hugh McCall and others, they had a terrible uh, – well, not a terrible amount of influence. They had an awful amount of influence. In you don't mean that pejoratively. No, you? not at all. You mean that gigantically. Gigantic. You mean that quantitatively. Ab okay. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and um, and uh, that's not the city we have now. Right. Uh, we don't have those same strong corporate leaders. The, the other problem with the Arts and Science Council model that has emerged over the years is that it disconnects people from the organizations yes. that, they, that are supported by the Arts and Science Council. You're giving your money to a middleman, and the middleman decides who gets what and how much. So if you're a fan of the Charlotte Symphony, it disconnects you from the Charlotte Symphony. If you're a fan of the ballet, it disconnects you from the ballet. This idea of a half, a quarter cent sales tax for the arts to go to the ASC doesn't fix that at all. Well, and you're getting to a, another huge problem, which is, and another cause of the decline of this type of fundraising, which is when you bring in smartphones and more technology and the fact that people want to know directly where their money is going, it's so much easier to say, well, I'm not going to give to ASC, I'm going to give to the ballet or I'm going to mm -hmm. give to the symphony. The same thing has happened with United Way in their fundraising. And of course, the umbrella groups like ASC will say, you know, we have buying power, we have uh, discernment and all these things that make it more effective. But that argument is obviously not resonating with donors, and that's why we've wound up here. It actually surprises me that uh, you, you mentioned, I think it was you, Glenn, that mentioned uh, a lot of the people who were speaking in favor of this were artists, because individual artists don't get a heck of a lot of money from the Arts and Science Council. I don't think they, they necessarily get a lot of money as individuals, but I think if they were here, they would probably say that the, that the Arts and Science Council creates an environment that allows their art to, to thrive and uh, 
creates an environment that uh, allows art to thrive throughout the community. I, I think that would be their contention. So in this proposal with the sales tax, $8 million, 16% of the money raised would go to education, $15 million or 30% would go to parks and greenways, and then about $2.5 million would go to the individual towns of Huntersville, Cornelius, Davidson, Matthews, Mint Hill, and Pineville for parks and the arts. Is that redundant? <laughs> Uh, no, is, parks and art? No, because it would be in those towns. That, the idea is that they could invest okay. in what's going on in their towns because they are contributing to the have, tax base. Is there an appetite or a need in those individual towns? Do we know? We, we haven't heard from, I, I mean, I think the assumption is that if money's available, they would, they would take it, but we haven't heard from them in terms of what they specifically want to do. So George Dunlop, who was the chair of the county commission, uh, when they were talking about the, not keeping the tax base revenue neutral with the property tax valuation coming in, he said something along the lines of, you know, we have programs to fund and we're going to fund them. This is an all democratically controlled county commission. Uh, and so he's playing into the hands of people who said, see, you elect Democrats and it's going to be tax and spend. But he is in favor of this proposal, along with several other commissioners. But as you mentioned, Eric, there are skeptics among the commissions, uh, commissioners, and those skeptics include Pat Cotham and Trevor Fuller. I have a hard time believing that this, as much as enthusiasm as, you know, the 200 or 250 people who are here tonight, I just wonder, I have a hard time believing that the whole county is going to be as supportive. So if you haven't heard about the campaign of what the quarter cent sales tax was for, when you get into that voting booth, what do you think your answer will be to that question? Do I want to tax myself? No, I don't want to tax myself. So what if you have heard about what this is for? Are you likely to be in favor of raising taxes for those things? Have they polled the community? Will they be on those who spoke last week or this week, I, Tuesday night. I was going to say, so this this tax, it's a quarter cent sales tax. The legislature gave counties in North Carolina a few years ago the ability to do it on their own with voter approval. Mecklenburg tried this not for the arts, but what was it? It was for no, teachers? No, it, it was teachers, but it had arts. Okay. It was about 7.5%, and it failed by, I think, 61.39. Yeah, it did. Five years ago. Yeah. And so, I mean, we've passed, Mecklenburg has passed, uh, has twice supported the transit tax, you know, once for the initial yeah. to put it in and then to fight back the repeal. But that the quarter set try, that, that failed bigly. Yeah. Well, and here's something yeah. that's interesting about that, Mike, if I can mention very quickly, is the language. That's what was being referred to in that clip from Trevor Fuller. It, it's not going to say, do you support a tax for the arts and parks, da 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 It's going to say, do you support a tax? That's what he was referring are, are to. They, well, why? why, why because that is, that's uh, the, the legislation from the state requires that it's just a, a simple, do you support the tax? Wow. I don't know what to say to the, about that. That just seems like it, it's deceptive on the face of it and, 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 and legislated to be deceptive on the face of it. I don't know if it's so much deceptive as incomplete. Well, yes, okay. Uh, I, think, I, I, think it, I think it's something like, do you, do you, do you support increasing the sales right. tax or something like that? So you know that you are voting to increase the sales tax, but it's not telling you where the money's going. Right. That's why you have to listen to this program. <laughs> and that's why we will come back after the break and talk some more about this, among other things, including uh, what, what's going on with the legislature and sheriffs around uh, the state, including our own sheriff, uh, Gary McFadden. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and the Charlotte Symphony. Summer Pops presents the best of Broadway at Symphony Park this Sunday, June 23rd. Grounds open for picnicking at 5 p.m. Concert begins at 8.15. Tickets at charlottesymphony.org. And try on medical partners and independent practice offering walk-in appointments at the Uptown Charlotte office. Try on medical partners with 89 physicians. Details at tryonmed.com. As you may have heard, the city is considering changes to Charlotte's noise ordinance in the face of rising complaints, but the possible change is controversial. Some see this as an attempt to tamp down on free speech because of ongoing demonstrations by activists outside a clinic providing abortions. So ahead of Monday night's city council vote, we will hear about the changes and concerns from members of council Monday on this program at 9.
He's running again, and the president set his sights on holding on to what he calls his second home. It's the great state of Florida. Joe Biden's opponents remind him that the good old days were not all that good, and some call Facebook's plan for a global currency more than a bit rich. It's the Friday News Roundup, next time on 1A. The Roundup of the Week's news continues on 1A right after Charlotte Talks here on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with our local news roundup of reporters. They would be Eric Spanberg. I'm going to do this just the way my eyeballs go. (laughs) Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal. Chandler Morgan is here from WBTV News. Glenn Birkins, editor and publisher of Q City Metro. And last but not least, uh, uh, Steve Harrison from WFAE News. Uh, we, We played two cuts from... Uh, commissioners who are a little skeptical about this quarter cent sales tax for uh, to fund primarily the arts, but also parks and education as well. But some some commissioners are okay with this. Uh, Vice Chair Elaine Powell says she would support the sales tax, but if it gave more money to education, because she says the number one thing that she hears from constituents is about education. How many commissioners are in favor of this, whether they want the money to go one place or the other? How many are, are likely to say yes? I think it's hard to tell at this point. Uh, commissioner Leak, uh, I would add her to the list of commissioners who uh, raised some serious concerns mm-hmm. about, about the tax as it's uh, currently uh, constituted. I think most of what I heard had more to do with how the money is going to be distributed. Uh, I think it's probably a safe bet to say that this will get a, get on the ballot. So just chronologically, the, the series of events, the Arts and Science Council made this proposal, I think, back in April. That was during the budget uh, meetings that le- led to the budget that's going to raise property taxes. You brought up an interesting point, Steve. Why didn't they just fold this into the 9% increase or make it 10% if they needed to uh, on the property tax or on the, on the budget, rather, what, did they really want to put this to a vote for the citizens because it's a political hot potato, or they just don't care about the arts really? So they think, want it to fail. So I think part of I, I think I, I think part of the thing is the ASC wants this dedicated funding stream. They don't want to have to go to the county or the city or to whomever, you know, asking slash begging each year. So if you get this tax, the money just comes in, and a sales tax in this economy in this city it grows. Right. It grows really fast. So that it would just be the best. But but it would be so good for them. But then at the same time, it seems like such a tough sell. And going back to the point, this was the budget. Everyone got something in this budget. Yeah. And we, and we were talking in the break. I wanted to mention this. George Dunlap, who you referred to as the chair of the board, he, he made a comment during the meeting the other night. He said that critics uh, have called this a regressive tax. but It is. It is a regressive tax. But... He doesn't see it that way. He sees it as more equitable because everyone contributes, unlike a property tax. I thought that was quite an interesting statement to make has about he, additional tax. Has he spoken to an economist? Because seriously, this is a sales tax is a regressive tax because sure. it's not uh, it's not set up to help you if you're poor or ver- it's the same on the poor and the rich, and, and that's one of the criticisms of any sales tax, and particularly a sales tax for. And uh, entertainment along those lines, Susan Rodriguez McDowell said, I do th- I do think it hurts lower income people more think. And then she went on to say that she supported the tax because arts create equity in different ways. So, as I say, I think this debate the next 10 days or so is going to get interesting. So with this sales tax or do we know be levied on everything Would would groceries be taxed as extra quarter cent? Do groceries, know, are, I, groceries are taxed at a lower sales tax right. rate than the general sales tax, but that's a good question. I don't know if the quarter cent would be added. School supplies, uh, would, would everything question. be lumped Clothing, in? Yeah, there was n- uh, there, there was no discussion stuff. of that. And uh, then th- there are a lot of facts. I mean, as we're going through all these questions, there were just so many things that were left out. It just felt a little sloppy in terms of something that's been out there for months, and there weren't a lot of answers. Is there a sunset on this tax, or was, is this in perpetuity if we pass it? I think it's in perpetuity. And the other thing, Steve, that I think you're hinting at when you're talking about the legislature, remember Mecklenburg County and other counties, they have this quarter cent, but then that's basically it. And you you have all kinds of other things that could pop up. I mean, the the odds of being able to go back to Raleigh and get additional uh, tax 
levying authority are pretty long. And we want, you know, CATS wants to do uh, six to seven billion dollars worth of trains. That will take, they have not said, but I think we can all assume that will take at least a penny. So let's say if we go quarter cent for arts, teachers, and greenways, that brings us to what, seven and a half? Yeah. Sales tax, another penny for CATS. That's eight and a half percent. That's a big bite. Yeah, but we could have mimes on the trains. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, the problem's been solved. <laughs> yes. This has been Charlotte Talks. Everybody's, everybody's in favor of that. Uh, I, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, this is going to, if, if they say yes to this, they're saying yes to a referendum. They're not saying yes to raising the sales tax. They're going to send this to voters in November. Is that the way it's always done? Or they don't, they want this done because they don't they don't want, they don't want to no, hold no, the hot th potato. This is required that the okay. voter, th this form of tax would have to be approved by voters. So is it likely to, they're likely to say yes to this, so that yeah. the voters can then say right. yes or no? Because the argument okay. will be let the people have their say. I think okay. we had didn't we have a similar tax similar referendum at one point that did not pass? I believe. Yeah. Yes. Like four or five years ago. Yeah, 2014. Yes, yeah. and 80 percent of that money was going to go to schools, and people want education, according to uh, the vice chair, Elaine Powell, but they said no to that. 80 percent was going to go to schools, 7.5 percent to CPCC, and another 7.5 percent to the arts, and the remainder would have gone to the library. And during the recession, when they were cutting funding on everything in the county, the only thing people cared about was the library, which shocked me. Yeah. I mean, whenever we talked about it on this program, people would just inundate us. Don't hurt the library. Interesting. Okay, moving on. Sheriffs in the state's most populous counties, ours among them, decided to end their department's uh, participation with immigration and enforcement and their 287G program, and that has Republican lawmakers in Raleigh unhappy. They are now considering something called House Bill 370. What would it do? In a nutshell, it would require uh, sheriffs in North Carolina to honor, uh, what is it, detention uh, orders or detention requests if there is uh, someone in a uh, county facility, a, an uh, inmate in a county facility who is here without uh, documentation and ICE issues a, uh, uh, is it retainer or? I think it's a retainer. And I yeah. think it's 48 hours. Remember, they were talking 96, now it's 48. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, of course, th the counties that we're talking about are all counties that have said, that, not have said, they don't comply with those ICE requests. And so that's the fight here. So lawmakers say that this House Bill 370 is meant to force sheriffs to get, quote, dangerous immigrants off the streets. But sheriffs in Mecklenburg, Buncombe, and Wake say that they suspect the bill is about more, and they oppose it because it infringes on their individual authority. Those sheriffs went to Raleigh to speak against the bill and to point out the characteristics of the sheriffs the most elected. They pointed out that the fact, they pointed out the fact that most sheriffs affected by this are Democrats, they are newly elected, they are from urban areas, and they are black. One of our one of the most vocal sheriffs at that meeting in Raleigh was our own sheriff, Gary McFadden. House Bill 370 is not about protecting our communities. It's not about making our communities safe. House Bill clearly is about attacking a select group of sheriffs who now have been carefully identified by using code words as urban sheriffs, sanctuary sheriffs, and the one I heard in this house that was more disturbing than anyone else, anything else, the super minority majority sheriffs. Simply meaning to me, the newly elected African American sheriffs of the seven largest counties in North Carolina. Do we know who in the legislature referred to these sheriffs as the super minority majority sheriffs? Do we know that that was actually said? I, I, I do not. Okay. Do you think he's exaggerating? Glenn. Which part? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think like any political debate, there is, there, is, there is some truth on all sides. I don't think this is purely about race. Uh, immigration and uh, illegal immigration, that's a, that's a hot button issue nationally. And this is how it's playing out here in North Carolina. So, uh, so to say that it's totally about race, I don't believe, 
is fair, uh, but I do believe that it that it uh, reflects North Carolina's urban uh, rural divide. Rural divide that we what continue is to see. What is a super minority majority? What does that mean? I don't yeah, know. I didn't make, make that. I w but if I were to guess, maybe and maybe like uh, Charlotte, where. Uh, they say this is a majority minority city because there is no there is no one group that makes up the majority anymore. Okay. I'll say that the, the, the fight over immigration between Raleigh um, and the cities does go back a little bit before the issue with the sheriffs. Um, if you go back in, in Charlotte a few years ago um, when Jennifer Roberts was mayor, the city was looking at doing municipal IDs. They the CMPD, the city council passed the civil rights resolution that said we are not going to ask about immigration status. Um, and at the time, Raleigh came in and bigfooted the city and said, I mean, what was it? It was like, you cannot do municipal IDs. Right. So this fight has been brewing um, for, uh, for many years, and it's just kind of been taken to a new level because of the sheriffs pulling out of 287G. And, and you could hear that in the language with uh, State Senator Dan Bishop, who was saying that sanctuary sheriffs must be stopped. And there's always the back and forth where uh, a lot of Republicans will say that Charlotte is a sanctuary city. It's not, but the, the view is that the, the politics lean that way. So what really kicked this off is the fact that these, these urban sheriffs, uh, sheriffs in these urban areas, let's put it, let's put it that way, meaning cities. Mm -hmm. Right. Not, not referring to the, the, the makeup of the population, because these are, these are the areas of the city, of, of the state that have cities. They decided not to participate in 287G, and 287G was an ICE program that asked sheriffs when they arrested somebody or put, held, held them in custody to ask about their immigration status. They decided not to do that because they say that that makes communities less safe because it makes people less willing to come forward and help police uh, go after the bad guys. Uh, now, this new thing is, is about detainers, ICE detainers, which one of you referred to, which are requests that ask sheriffs to hold an inmate until ICE can take custody of that inmate. How ICE knows that they're there, I don't know, because they don't participate in the 287G program. The sheriffs who refuse to do this say, that those requests are not legally binding and that the sheriffs themselves could face legal consequences if they hold an inmate beyond the terms of his or her sentence. Is that true? And is that the case in most of these cases? Would that happen? Do we know? I think there isn't there a... I don't know. Actually, I, I was going to fumble for an answer, but I, I, can't, North, I can't answer that Because the, Nor the, the sheriffs also say it limits their authority. But yes. the North Carolina Sheriff's Association reversed their stand on this bill. They were opposed to it. Right. Now they're in favor of it. Why? What changed? One thing that changed is that those requests would now go before a judge. And I think that would, or a magistrate. I think yes. that is the, I think that was the, and continues to be the big sticking point. Uh, uh, generally speaking, in order to uh, detain someone, there needs to be a warrant. And, and uh, basically these are, not warrants, they're requests. They're not legal, right. they're not legally binding. ICE is saying, hey, do me a favor. Uh, you've got someone there, hold them. And I think the sheriffs are saying that's not, why, that's why not doesn't, legal. Why doesn't the federal government have the power to just say, do it? I think the federal government does have well, the power. Well, they are the federal but they, government. But they, I don't think that has been enacted. I don't think that legislation has. Well, and you remember uh, Nick Oxner was on a couple weeks ago. He had the story with Andrew Murray and the whole, th that was a, a fight about detainers. Right. So, Steve, in a related story this week, uh, President Trump tweeted that ICE will begin removing millions of people next week who are here illegally. First, has that been confirmed, or was this just one of the president's random tweets about policy that turned out to be a surprise to the agencies who have to carry out that policy? Or, second, what has been the reaction in this city, in the city's immigrant community to this? So I think ICE, um, ICE put out a statement after that that it seemed to kind of, you read between the lines, seemed to suggest like, well, we're going to continue to do routine enforcement and I think routine was emphasized. It seemed to them, it seemed to ICE to be, and what you read in the national media was, we, we, we don't really know about this. This is not something we're planning on. But um, I think in the immigrant community, obviously it, it, people are terrified. And, and we spoke to some, uh, to some people who said that they think next week people won't show up to work. 
they'll keep uh, they'll stay low. But it's interesting the whole tweet. I mean, that was a huge story for one day nationally, and then of course, right, Iran happens, That's right. and it just becomes another. Um, Is it possible, even technically, humanly possible, to remove millions of people next week? No, no, no. Okay, uh, let's move on. Homicides. Uh, this is a terrible number. 57 is the number. Uh, uh, and that, that is the number of people who have died as a result of homicide so far this year in Charlotte. The total number for last year was 58. And we're not even halfway through the year. Uh, is it still the case that we don't understand what's driving this? I think that, I th I think that is still the case, that there is no single factor driving it, unlike... Uh, Unlike during the crack epidemic of the 1980s, there is you can't point to one thing and say these are these are gangs fighting for a drug turf or whatever. Uh, many of them uh, just have uh, various and diverse reasons. If there's any good news here, it is that the rate of increase has slowed. We were we were on a horrid pace or earlier this year, and if you had told me earlier this year that we would be approaching the end of June with with just the number we have, mm. as high as that number is, I would have I would have never guessed it, uh, because we were on a pace to reach this number much faster. So the so the pace of growth has slowed, or the pace of increase. Back back in the '60s, uh, in the summertime, that's when violence increased. Are we likely to see an increase? Do you think because of it, it, and they attributed it to the heat? Are we likely to see that? This time around, I think it's hard to tell. Uh, is it still the case that police feel stymied in their ability to get a handle on this because people will not come forward and help them with their investigation? I was going to say that that was the uh, the teenage girl who was murdered this week. Mm -hmm. That was an instance where the police said that the community really came forward and helped with the arrests of the three people who are accused, uh, but but I think it's also safe to say that that has been a problem. I mean, the, I, Chief Putney and others have said it over and over, that getting people in the community to come forward and say who might have been involved remains a problem. So it was announced last week that BB&T and uh, SunTrust ha had announced the name of their soon-to-be-merged bank to be headquartered here. The name is Truist. Well, the fun didn't last long <laughs> because this week, True Lion Federal Credit Union filed a trademark infringement suit because the name is too close to theirs, Truist True Lion. Have we heard any reaction from BB&T and SunTrust? They have both declined to comment I wonder on why. legal matters. They say at, at True Lion that Truist infringes on their other true family trademarks, including that of the dinosaur, evidently, <laughs> and, and might lead to consumer confusions and if confusion. And experts say this is likely to be settled out of court. Uh, <laughs> there was once a boxer, Carl the Truth Williams. I okay. wonder if he knows about yeah. this. I, I don't know. We may come back and talk more about this, but then False. We, may, we, oh, may, we may move on to Pittsburgh, which is where you <laughs> spent most of, the, most of the week last week. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Antahela Outdoor Center, offering outdoor adventures since 1972 with whitewater rafting adventures on seven rivers across the southeast. More at NOC.com. And doctors making house calls, 105 primary care and specialty clinicians helping complex patients avoid unnecessary ER visits and hospitalizations. Clinical positions available throughout the Carolinas. Info at doctorsmakinghousecalls.com. Well, the roundup of the week's news continues at 10 o'clock on 1A with a look at the national news. This week, President Trump kicked off his re-election bid in Orlando. What did we learn about this campaign strategy? The first Democratic presidential debates will begin next week, and we'll get a preview of that. They're also following the latest from a congressional hearing on reparations, and they'll check in with the southern border, Joshua Johnson, and a panel of journalists. We'll cover those stories and more next on WFAE, and we will continue in 30 seconds. Chris Lamb, managing partner for Bradley in Charlotte, a WFAE sponsor. Just like the audience for WFAE, Bradley cares about our community. Our lawyers are invested in different organizations and volunteering and doing pro bono legal work. And so I think we share a lot of the same values that the WFAE audience cares about as well. 
Being a WFAE sponsor says a lot about your business. Learn more. Email sponsorship at WFAE.org. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's the local news roundup. Our little get together on Friday, and we'll uh, we'll we'll introduce we'll re we'll reset. Eric Spanberg is here from the Business Journal. Steve Harrison from WFAE News. Chandler Morgan from WBTV News, and uh, Glenn Birkins from QCityMetro.com. Uh, one more thing about this truest thing: <laughs> if they can't use that name, and they spent they spent a lot of money to some company that searches the the world for for words that interbrand this is true but they search the world for words that mean nothing in any language so that you can't be sued (laughs) and they got sued uh for for truest so have they have they dodged a bullet here if they can't use the name are they oh i see what you're saying (laughs) (laughs) did did they blunder into a better name yes Yes. I think your question is uh, self-explanatory. Okay. Uh, uh, Rhetorical. You you tagged along with city leaders on their field trip to Pittsburgh. Truest, yes. Last week. 150 political and business leaders went there to learn how Pittsburgh changed themselves from a dirty steel town to the center of uh, tech and health care. Atlanta went to Pittsburgh last month to learn about Pittsburgh on a similar fact-finding mission. Okay, you were there, aside from the inclines. And, uh, what, what makes Pittsburgh such a magic place? The Disney World of Pennsylvania. The Disney World of Pennsylvania. That's, that's really hard to overcome. Uh, uh, well, one thing, you mentioned Atlanta and then Charlotte goes. A, a lot of people in Pittsburgh, you know, the, the leaders of foundations and companies. I mean, everybody from Pittsburgh has moved here. So right, I, right. There were a lot of jokes about that. That was one. And two was the people who are still in Pittsburgh running things were sort of gobsmacked and like you guys are coming to us i mean you, you have the growing population and the weather and the money they've and all lost stuff. more pop they lost more population than we gained in the same time it's it's pretty yeah. close but it's like off right. by five hundred thousand. yeah yeah and and they lost in the 80s of course they lost a quarter of a million people i mean right. that is just all but impossible to believe in a place like charlotte where it's constant growth uh, but but they have done some things really well as you said they they have a very robust higher education system that's led them into some tech and research type areas that have helped their economy they're very strong in healthcare and the other thing uh, that i think they've been able to do possibly because it is a stagnant population in some ways, is they have uh, more cohesive campaigns when they address things like economic mobility and other problems because uh, they have a tradition of philanthropy and people just tend to know each other. Yeah, they do have a tradition of philanthropy driven by these major people like uh, Heinz, uh, uh, Carnegie, Mellon, uh, University, the Mellon, whoever they are. They have a tradition and foundations set up for philanthropy that Charlotte does not not have right uh, and I don't think many cities in the south do because that was the center of the industrial revolution up there and yeah. that's what led to all of this did we learn anything from their tradition of philanthropy that we could actually adopt and use in the face of the fact that we don't have this uh, well I think the thing that jumped out at people uh, from Charlotte is the way that for example Pittsburgh has Basically, uh, people assigned, professionals assigned to specific families to navigate all of the social services issues that low-income people tend to face. Uh, So you have a dedicated answer. You don't have to sort of wander around uh, trying to figure out where to go. That was a concrete example of what they've done that's worked. So Panther owner David Tepper, who was until he became the owner of the Panthers, a minority owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, also spoke. Uh, And he, I think spoke about what they've done with development between, was it the baseball stadium and the new football stadium and and what happens in this half mile or mile in between the two in terms of economic development. Uh, He talked about that. Is that, is, is he setting the stage? Oh my. (laughs) Is he setting the stage for the new stadium here and what it could mean for Charlotte? Because there will be a new stadium. Your skepticism continues to sadden me, Mike, that <laughs> people would go on a trip to maybe float a trial balloon of uh-huh. some things that might be publicly and privately funded. Uh, I mean, clearly, that was a big piece of the motivation is to have uh, David Tepper show off his city and show off what the Steelers and the Pirates had done. Uh, and it is impressive what they've done in terms of private development private development, of course, you have to include the caveat that public money 
not only paid for the two stadiums, but they paid for a lot of the infrastructure in between. So uh, that clearly is on his mind. And I, whether it's a new stadium or a renovated stadium, I think the thing to look at here is that David Tepper is very interested in significant chunks of real estate in Uptown to have an entertainment district to, you know, keep people around the football stadium longer. Yeah, because the Steelers, I mean, again, I don't think it's necessarily going to be a new stadium because the Steelers play, which he was the minority owner, they play in an outdoor stadium. Okay. So it's not as though he's coming from a city, coming from a team that had this huge indoor stadium with a retractable roof. Right. You know, it's possible that... Do they have a practice bubble? You know what's funny? I, I, we didn't go... There was no inclusion on the trip of their training center or their... Which I thought that would have been a natural... Uh, I think maybe it's because that's done, right? right? We've already checked that off yeah, the list yes, in South Carolina, yes. so let's move on to yes. phase two. See? Okay, let's, let's expand this coverage beyond Charlotte. Bring it back from Pittsburgh. Yes. Bring it... Take it out from... <laughs> uh, the city of Statesville voted on Monday night to keep its size limit for flags... Who knew? Uh, to 25 by 40 feet. Uh, Chandler, I think you covered this. So why, why did this come up as an issue at all for the people of Statesville? Well, when you look at the big flag that's outside of Gander RV, I think... I knew nothing about it. <laughs> well, I mean, on I-77, it's hard to miss. I mean, I think that the fact that that's flying, that was a big deal. They wanted to be able to uh, make it to where it could fly, but... So, so the, fl the, the flag outside of Gander RV, as I understand it, is 40 by 80 feet, which is the size of an NBA basketball court. It's pretty big, yeah. I mean, and, but it's, it's not allowed right now. And I think that was the push was to make it allowed. But then they came back and said, no, that's just not going to happen. This is an American flag. It's not a Confederate right. flag. So why are they upset? Why is there why is there a size restriction on American flags? And that's what everybody said in this city. That's the question they want answered is why is it such a big deal that it's so big it's it's not in anybody's way it's not a safety issue and they're not downtown the, right this, this rv dealership right they're on the interstate it's smack dab in the middle of their property so it's not like it's blocking anything i think and th that's what a lot of people want answered is the fact that this is an american flag they should have the right to fly it if they want to and we support it so uh there's a lot of confusion as to why that's not changing so i guess the question i would ask is can you legally discriminate between one type of flag and another if you permit the american flag to fly that large uh, could you say that other types of flags could not okay uh, in may the city filed a complaint and said that the flag had to come down and that gander rv had to pay eleven thousand dollars in fines and i think they're ongoing daily amounts of money added to that but the flag continues to fly are they paying the fine they're not no i spoke with marcus uh, the ceo on the phone and he said they have yet to receive a bill for that uh, so obviously you know there's a court battle a court battle um coming and he said he's prepared to fight that and yet they still haven't had to pay any of these uh fees that they're supposed to so statesville city council voted not to change their ordinance uh, to allow the big flag they, they, they still don't want it but john stafford who is a stateful statesville city council member supports the CEO of the company. He said that it has always been my belief that the American flag should not be part of our sign ordinance. Government has the responsibility to pass laws and ordinances that create order and safety. This violates none of those parameters. So what has been the argument against that? I mean, in a sense... Just that we have this rule and you've broken it? Right, exactly. I mean, and that's what Marcus told me on the phone was he's waiting for really just an actual explanation other than the fact that this is just violating an ordinance. You know, he talked to me on the phone and said that this is something that's been meant a lot to him as a, his family grew up with large American flags outside of, of their businesses. And that's something he wanted to continue. So for him, he's waiting for a response. He's waiting for that why, that explanation, just as everybody else is in the city. So what happens now? Uh, they'll they'll go to court and and they'll battle it out and we'll see. Okay, all day yesterday, or at least for a good part of the day yesterday, we were waiting to see if the Supreme Court, because they they issued a lot of decisions yesterday, and not a lot, but some, uh, and we were waiting to see if one of those decisions would be the ger the political gerrymandering case in North Carolina. It did not come down yesterday. We're told that we might get a decision on that on Monday. So remind us, Steve, what this case is about and the impact a decision would have one way or the other. So the case is called Common Cause versus Rucho. Common Cause is, um, is the, the plaintiff, and Rucho refers to Bob Rucho, who was in the leadership of the 
General Assembly when the suit was filed. And it's over North Carolina's congressional map that was drawn, um, as everyone agrees and admits, to give Republicans an advantage of to hold 10 of the 13 seats. Common Cause says that is this, it's this extreme, they use the words like brutal, partisan gerrymander, done with uh, sophisticated computer software to pack Democrats into three seats and to dilute Democrats in other places. So if Common Cause wins, there will be a new map in North Carolina, but it would also extend, it would be such a bigger decision because this would extend to places like Ohio, other states that have, that have, have really aggressive gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing is we've never had partisan gerrymandering that's right. Right. It's always been on racial gerrymandering racial is gerrymandering. unconstitutional. Right. Partisan okay. gerrymandering right. as at, at this moment is yes. not. Uh, the high court is considering several of these gerrymandering cases, and some are we- making their way through the lower courts to the high court. Among them, one in Maryland, uh, and I think that's on the docket. So, how does each ca- each case impact the other? Could they decide one way on one and one way on the other, or would, will one decide both? I think that's a good question. I think one is going to decide both. Um, Back in March when they heard oral arguments, North Carolina went first, and then the Maryland case came immediately after that. The Maryland case involves um, the Democrats drawing the map to (laughs) squeeze one extra seat for them in that state. So I think that they're basically the same issue. I I think it would be hard to see one going one way and one going the other. Um, But, uh, you know, the question for the court is – there were kind of two different arguments back in March. Uh, on one side, there are two plaintiffs. Common Cause argued that any attempt to to give your party an advantage over the other is unconstitutional. The League of Women Voters is also a party to the suit. And, and they took a little bit of a different approach. They said, we only want you to intervene in the most extreme cases. They were basically saying, everyone's going to do this. Everyone's going to try and and help themselves and give themselves an advantage we just want you to step in when it gets really out of control. So we'll see what happens on Monday, whether we get a decision. 10 a.m. Okay. <laughs> right after the show goes off the air. Perfect timing. Okay. <laughs> Eastland Mall is back in the news. Uh, that's because uh, Crossland Southeast uh, uh, was, I guess, chosen a couple of months ago uh, to develop on the site. And on Wednesday, Crossland was part of a public meeting to share their plans for the site. Like Birkdale Village, this would be a live, work, play development. Not many of the people attending Wednesday's meeting were concerned about the housing portion of the plan, however. Crosla manager, managing partner, uh, Tim, is it Satima? Is that how you Cinema. say it? Cinema. Uh, painted an attractive picture of what they're planning. The, the storyline here is we want uh, high quality architecture. We want variation in design. We want interesting architecture. We want appealing streetscape, and we want a variation of price points and forms, so that we've got a neighborhood that that is very, 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 very appealing. That's four varies, but he told the crowd that when it comes to the office portion of the project, it's been hard to get other developers interested in the site, as opposed to other Crosland projects like Brookdale Village in Huntersville or Waverly off Providence Road. The office is a tougher sell at this point. We've had a lot of meetings with people trying to get jobs and, and, and offices here. Um, and, and, uh, and so far, we've, we've not found those, those lead tenants to, uh, to lead something like that. Did he say what the stumbling blocks appear to be for office development? He, he did. Um, throughout the, the public meeting, um, he was very bullish on what they want to do at Eastland, very optimistic. But he also was cautioning everyone in the audience, telling him that this is a different project. They're used to going into the suburbs, like you said, Birkdale Village, where um, people have a lot of money, and it's just easy to get tenants. And he kind of kept saying, like, this is, this is a little harder. Um, people aren't building offices in East Charlotte, and they think that it can happen, yeah. but it's just a tougher sell. Um, there was one instance, I thought it was interesting back and forth, there was someone in the audience who looked at the site plan and said, you know what, I see a lot of surface parking here. I don't like that. I want more green space. And he said, you know, it's yes, I agree with you, but to build a parking deck, it just costs a lot more money. And right now, we're not sure we can charge enough rent to pay for that. Steve, there was also there was also some some concern about housing, I believe there was, yeah, uh, about the about the nature of the housing, uh, what price points those uh, might might actually work there. I think Crosland wants 
wants, wants a slightly higher price point than some of the developers it's, it's sought to work with. And they're clearly trying to bring people in from other neighborhoods, maybe a little more affluent, and so you have that dilemma as well of not over-gentrifying. School systems, I'm going to change topics now. The school systems around the state, including CMS, want the legislature to provide additional funding for a mandate that they made about class size reductions in grades K through 3 uh, because the, it's going to require more rooms. Uh, or mobile classrooms, and it's going to require more teachers. Uh, how much money does CMS say they need? Chandler, do you know? You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think the fact that they're asking for it means that they're trying to – it's, it's kind of like you have two options right now. They say that they have an issue, but what is, what is going to be the better option? You can't fix it immediately, obviously, because if you go the mobile classroom route, you run into multiple issues. I mean, you run into, obviously, A, it's not connected to the schools, and then B, long term, I mean, when we talk about school safety, that's just another issue. I think that long, long term, they're wanting more funding just because they want to say, hey, we have this issue, but we're just going to need to fix it somehow. But this is a statewide mandate. We only have 20 seconds left. Statewide mandate. So systems around the state are saying this. Was this an oversight on the part of the legislature to mandate this without funding associated with it? I think it was, yeah. Is it likely to be fixed? It's it's hard to tell at this point just because of the way Lock that the... Clock is ticking. Yeah, it really is. So, Chandler Morgans with WBTV News. Glenn Birkins is editor-publisher of QCDMetro.com. Eric Spanberg, managing editor of the Charlotte Business Journal. And Steve Harrison, reporter for WFAE News. Thank you all for the hour. Charlotte Talks with my...